I don't like, you know, this blanket political correctness of we have to do it this way. I think we need to keep the individuals and I think we need to respect that racing drivers are not normal human beings. They're matadors, they're gladiators. And we want them to be gladiators. There is a team out there that's struggling with traction at the moment, really poor traction. Or a couple of them are, probably more than that. But I know one team is. And I was talking to one of the engineers from that team today. And I said, why, you know, it's a chronic thing. You've had this traction issue for months now. Why did you say, well, just soften the rear or do what, you know, you normally would. And he said, oh, we can't make any adjustments because if we did, we'd have to build a completely new gearbox. In other words, they've designed the wrist suspension around their gearbox, which, and it's got very little adjustability in it. And the team said, oh no, don't, don't ask that question. We can't ask any questions about sweet spots. I just thought, what is this all about? I mean, do these people, I mean, do they live on the planet Earth? Hello and welcome to another episode of the F1 Hour. With me as always, my friend, your friend, the greatest F1 mind to have ever grated. The one they call Mr. PTD Windsor. How are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm probably the tiredest journalist <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah, I'm all right. What is it? You know, half past two in the morning here in oh, Singapore. Mate, just dead. about just about the end of it. But yeah, lovely to talk to you, Cameron. See your smiling face as ever. Oh, mate, dedication to the game. I appreciate it. Appreciate you as always, Mr. Windsor, taking the time out. Shall we talk about some F1 each? Because I think there's a couple of strands. Let's talk about some F1 stuff. Yeah. I definitely. think there's a couple of threads at which we need to pull. As is compulsory, um, in your humble opinion, Mr. Windsor, what was the biggest story over this race weekend? Oh, Lando's um Lando's approach to the weekend uh, from minute one of Friday practice through to taking the checkered flag. Uh, and and what that means really in terms of his dynamic with Oscar and with the team also, and uh, I, and it was a peerless win. I mean, it really was. I mean, the best moment of the race for me, uh, as I said in my video, actually was was when McLaren got onto Lando to say, you know, see if he can eke it out, eke it out to five seconds maybe by lap thirteen, fourteen, and and bang, he's leading by twenty seconds before they've even blinked. You know. And he's not overstretching the car or himself. And and I, I just thought, wow, that is really impressive. Uh, so, yeah, it was that. And again, you know, we've got this theme of, of Max and Red Bull constantly uh, limiting the damage of, of Lando going well now in a very quick car. And again, OK, a few points were taken from Max, but not many today. So very strong drive by Max into second place in what was obviously not as good a car as the McLaren in terms of grip level and beating Oscar Piastri. You know, that was, that was quite impressive actually. I thought he, he wasn't bad. This race weekend was Lando Norris. Everything that we know he can be and more executing, not making any mistakes off the start, finally breaking the six race curse that was him starting on pole and, and not getting to the end of any one of those first laps in first position no i, I yeah. think he was i think yeah, he was good really point. good yeah no i think he was really good peter talk to me about oscar though because he had a less than perfect race weekend didn't he and i feel like now more than ever if lando harbors aspirations of challenging maximilian verstappen for the championship the uh the, the team radio of a couple of race weekends ago that lando you're going to need oscar and the team to help you kind of feels like it's more uh pertinent now more than ever, Peter, no? Yeah, I mean, how much help he'd be able to give him. I'm sure if, you know, if we had the hungry situation in reverse, for sure Oscar will slow down and let Lando fast. And as I said before, you know, when we've chatted, I think if they're running 1-2 or 2-1, if you want to look at it that way, and they're way ahead of everybody else, probably Oscar would now give the win to Lando, I suspect, partly because of what happened in Hungary and partly because he's a good team player. But those are the only two situations. I mean, if they're in traffic of any sort or they're not leading, um, and I, I can't imagine they're going to play around too much with team orders doing that. But I think that subject hails into insignificance alongside the points that Lando has not scored, basically as a result of what happened in Hungary. And, and that's a much bigger thing. That's much bigger than will Oscar be the team player now? You know, what will he do? Maybe help Lando with three or four points or something like that. But... You know, the points Lando's lost, gave away and lost subsequently uh, are ridiculous. And 
and Baku for me, as I said at the time, you know, and I've talked a lot about that this weekend with quite a lot of people, you know, and for both McLarens to come in five minutes to go at the end of Q1 uh, in Baku when there are 16 cars on track and it's almost certain you're going to get traffic and or a yellow or maybe even a red. You stay out there. You put enough fuel in the car to stay out there, as they did with Charles Leclerc. His tyres were hot on the Ferrari. He didn't get the best run, but it was still enough to get him into Q2. And he was P3 or something at the end of Q1. And that was just being out there doing a lap, finding a free lap. And yet they brought both McLarens in. One of them was going to hit a yellow flag, for sure, at some point. But the average is that number of cars out on the street circuit with all those walls. And it was Lando. And he lost that. And as a result, he potentially lost a win in Baku. He could, in the way he's driven today at Singapore, you've got to think, why didn't he win Baku? And then you go, back, oh, yeah, he got that yellow. That's why he didn't win. Uh, but he got the yellow because I put it under the heading of poor management by the team. And had he, had he got through to Q2, he probably would have been top three in qualifying, probably top two, probably would have won the race. Wow. Very, very true, Mr. Windsor. Go on then, with, mm. with six races remaining, and the gap in the driver's standings between Messers Verstappen and Norris, 52 points. Uh, he, he needs to outscore Maximilian Verstappen at a lick of 8.66 points per race. Is this really doable, Peter? Have we really got Well, I think if you start, you start looking in terms of all those stats, it's, you know, you get yourself twisted in knots. What you can say, I mean, it's not just that, of course. There are some sprint races coming as well. So you've got to factor those in. Uh, that's the first point. And secondly, when the margin is what it is, but you can still get a lot of points for a win, you've got to look at it in terms of what would stop Max finishing top three or four in every race from here on in. Are, are Honda, Red Bull going to strike some sort of unreliability issues? That's the biggest question. And that's what everybody in the, in the team, anyone with a brain in a team would only be thinking about would be reliability. Everybody knows that if Max has a reliable car, about the worst he's ever going to finish is fourth or fifth. So first of all, it's reliability. Is that Honda engine going to be as reliable as the Mercedes in this last period? That's the first thing. And, and the installation, everything goes with it. Yeah. They've already used one extra engine. But then again, you know, it may, may come to McLaren as well, that penalty thing. But at the moment, that's the biggest question mark. And I would say at the moment, reliability is on the side of McLaren Mercedes a little bit, not much. And today, Red Bull were rock solid, weren't they, in terms of of the car. But we've seen things go wrong on that car. I mean, Melbourne, classic example with Max. And then he's had all that other business with the engine losing power and all that stuff. And 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 he, equally on top of that, you know, the imbalance. But even with the imbalance and the tyres, I still think he's going to be a fourth or fifth if he even, you know, he's only got reliability. So it comes down to reliability. If Max fails to finish it, let's say three of the remaining Grand Prix, then of course Lando has a really good chance. And that's what, you know, that's what we have to think. All this other business of how many points has Max got to score. I mean, that's all rubbish. And, and Max won't be thinking that way. He'll all he'll be thinking about is rock solid reliability, please. Yeah. Build me a tank, and that's what he wants. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. he'll leave before his contract ceases in 2028, so some say. Peter, let me ask you about this, because, again, this is one of the, the bits, one of the subject topics that the community's um, arguing about. Better drive this race weekend was Lando Norris in a very quick car, ostensibly the quickest on the grid, or Maximilian Verstappen wrestling that RB20 to a outperforming it some would say to a second place who was the better of the drive who would you give your drive well, of the day to that's why i never have these things on my youtube channel about driver of the day or who was the best this or the best that the quickest in the web because there are so many factors involved in thinking about who did a good job and it obviously relates to the equipment they're in uh, and you say Max wrestling. I didn't see him wrestling, actually. I saw him driving incredibly smoothly and, and well right inside the envelope of, of where the car probably wanted to go if it had been given its head. And, and so that's the problem. You never really know how bad the car is when Max and decent drivers are behind the wheel because they make it still make it look really good. No, I would. I mean, I wouldn't want to be do that you know I, I would still probably give it to Franco Colapinto to be honest oh. you know never been there before drove a very good race if you want to sort of give an award to somebody who didn't get a point which is more appropriate I think for that driver of the day thing um, but yeah I mean Lando was faultless absolutely but he got his win he got his trophy he's got his points so do we need to give him anything more than that we just <laughs> we know how good he is 
I know how good he is. I've known how good he is since he was in Formula Three. I don't, you know, I'm just so pleased that he's now able to show that talent. So, and I, uh, I still wish that he would get rid of all. So it, I think it's the so. And the reason I talk about he should get off the social media for a while and all that stuff is because I think because of the social media, he's kind of tempted into being too nice a guy and not being the real Lando Norris that he needs to be to get out there and beat Oscar and Max. And and because he's very conscious of the whole social media thing, it's, you know, I, I think it's kind of detracting from his unbelievable talent as a racing driver. That's all. That's the reason I say that. I'm not, nothing at social media in general, but um, I just think for Lando as an athlete right now, he needs to just become very tough and hard. And I think there's a real opportunity to do that now after what he's done today at Singapore tonight. Rob. He, uh, you know, he was just superb. I mean, to see somebody pull out that sort of gap that easily, that well, it's not just the car. That is beautiful driving. You don't see that 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 often. And you could argue maybe he was going a bit too quick and, you know, pushing the tires a bit too hard. Mm. Max doesn't do that sort of thing. He doesn't take out, you know, 12 seconds in 10 laps, does he? He, he? he Generally, if he's in a dominant situation, he generally takes it easy. But anyway, I've got nothing but respect for Lando. I think he drove beautifully today. He, he wasn't bad at all. And ironically, Peter, he said at the post-race press conference that he was pushing the car too hard unnecessarily because he was trying to eke out the gap, get himself a cheeky free pit stop towards the latter stage of the, the Grand Prix, and then nail the, the final point for quickest lap. So he yeah, himself... Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, for sure he was pushing. And and in a way, that's a good thing because it keeps your concentration as well on a race like that. When you have got a dominant car, you know the only thing that can beat you is yourself or the car. Yeah. Then if concentration is the only thing. He had a couple of lapses, but, you know, that's excusable on a race like that. It's as hot as that as well. But so, yeah, he was pushing it, obviously, but he wasn't doing crazy things because that's not the way he drives anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Peter, talk to me about this melee with mm. the expletives. I don't know how much you've been keeping track of this, but Max. Yeah, was, I saw that. So, what, yeah. what do you think? Chime in. I'm keen what? to get your view because because I well, thought I, 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 because I, I knew. Yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say I felt really bad for the guy who hosts the FIA press conferences when Max was like, I felt really, really bad. But I was also like, give it to him, Max, because I felt like the punishment that they gave him was just. What community service for an expletive? I'm like, is this commensurate really? Like, this is this is nonsense. So, how, how would you have handled that, Peter, back in back in the day when 2007 you were pitching questions at Fernando and Lewis when they would get a bit a bit prickly with you? I, I, like, what's the what's the panacea for a responsible journalist to to kind of break that ice and foster rapport when Max is no selling and and giving it the no comment and I don't want to talk to you. Oh, you mean that rather than expletives? So chime in on both. I'm keen to get your opinion on both, but particularly the latter, Peter, since you were once... Oh, well, the latter. I love the latter because <laughs> it's it's just mind games. And you know, Michael Michael particularly was, was into that. You know, the more Michael could get away with saying nothing mm -hmm. and put a journalist in a slightly nervous situation, the better he felt. It was a little, another little mini world championship one <laughs> from Michael's point of view. He's a very competitive guy. So I love that. And I love trying to sort of get back at Michael and, and yeah, and Nico Rosberg too was another that was very difficult. I always found. And I, you know, to me, it's just like they're human beings and I can have a conversation with them. They say something I don't understand, or I think it's a bit stupid. I'll tell them. And so that's it. You know, that's my style of journalism. It's probably why I don't get to do many interviews today because most of the teams probably know that. And the last thing they want is Windsor putting their driver under any sort of pressure and asking him questions. They don't want us. I mean, to, I won't I won't name the team and I won't name the driver, but I was supposed to do an interview with him today and they wanted the questions in advance, which is something I really do not like having to do because for me, a good interview is to listen to what they've got to say and respond to what they're saying. And if the guys just put the car on the third row when it normally is on the fifth row, the opening question is going to be, wow, great job putting the car on the third row. I'm not going to stick to some ridiculously agreed format. Anyway, um, Look, it, it got, I, one of the questions that I did send to them was, you know, we, we this 24 Formula One season seems to be coloured by cars magically finding a sweet spot and then losing it. And then a couple of races later, they get it back again. And one team's quick and then another one's quick. And the team said, oh, no, don't, don't ask that question. We can't ask any questions about sweet spots. I just thought, what is this all about? I mean, do these people... 
I mean, do they live on the planet Earth? But anyway, anyway, that that was just so ridiculous. But um, so I, you know, I enjoy that banter. And the more the driver's monosyllabic and difficult, the more I like it. It's a bit like, you know, it's typical me, but I quite like today's race because it was a straightforward demonstration of how good Lando Norris and the McLaren are if they're given an opportunity. A lot of people would say it was a boring race. There was no overtaking, no safety cars, no this, no that. I love today's race. I love, I love straightforward demonstrations of brilliance. I love that. So that's the first thing. The other point about the, I knew you were going to ask this question. I suspected you were about the expletives. Hmm. And I've been thinking, and the reason I've mentioned it in my videos is because I, I didn't know how I talked about it really. Um, I know how I used to think about it. I used to think that it was completely wrong. And I remember the first driver I heard using a word like that on live radio was Ralph Schumacher. And I remember talking to Herbie Blash about it and saying, I hope you guys are going to do something about this because it will get out of control if, if you don't. And he just laughed and said, no, Bernie thinks it's brilliant. So I thought, oh, well, nothing's going to happen there then. So that was the, and then I thought, well, that's wrong. You know, they shouldn't be doing that. What if young kids are listening? But then another side of me in the last, I don't know, couple of months, maybe, maybe longer, says to me, Max Verstappen has spent all his life dedicated to being the best racing driver in the world. That's all he's ever been. And if he's now being chastised for, for the language he uses, that's a little bit wrong. There's something wrong about that. Now, I'm not saying that we should all go around effing and blinding and saying whatever we want to say, whenever we want to say it. It's all about respect, and it's all about being a good human being, being a kind person, respecting others, and thinking of others, wanting for them what you want for yourself, basically. That's, you know, that is the golden rule. That is humanity. And I don't know. We have a certain de social decorum, and I suppose you should have respect for that social decorum. But in reality, it, you know, if if a world champion whose English is not his, nat his natural language, his native language, is using words like that, then I come back to my other point. You've got this ridiculous thing with all the PR marketing people in the teams controlling the questions you're allowed to ask their precious drivers. And yet these people are not educating their drivers on what to say in certain interview forums. In other words, words that can be used maybe on the radio because it'll get bleeped out and words that can't be used in an FIA press conference because it might go out live. I mean, if they, if they took as much trouble to educate their drivers in that area as they do in stopping journalists asking questions about does the car have a big or small sweet spot, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. I think that's my, that's my thing. I don't like, you know, this blanket political correctness of we have to do it this way. I think we need to keep the individuals and I think we need to respect that racing drivers are not normal human beings. They're matadors, they're gladiators. And we want them to be gladiators. We don't want them to be disrespectful. We want them to be good people. We hopefully we want them to be kind people. But at the same time, I don't think we should be telling them how to speak. I think the teams, if they want to have control of their drivers, let them tell them how to speak. You know, what, they earn their money for a change in those marketing PR departments, media departments, whatever they call it, and get their drivers to behave as they think they should behave. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Peter. I couldn't have put it better myself. I, I think it's, um, I, I don't like this, this the, the, the idea, the thesis of Snowflake F1. I don't want the sport that we know and love to be sanitized. And again, with a young man, I don't want to hear like radio message where there's more bleep than there is words. That's not ideal. But th mm. th then the FIA and the, the, the production and the FOM need to get their arms around it then rather than, you know what I mean? This is, this is. Well, they do, but they need to get their arms around these media departments in the Formula One teams because they're the people, quite obviously, who are controlling what the drivers say because they're certainly controlling what the journalists are allowed to ask the drivers. So, ergo, they can say to them, right, here's the interviews where you can swear, here's the interviews where you can't. It's not that difficult to do that. I mean, I could come up with a list in about five minutes. 100%. Um, 100%. You know, and somebody else, some agency would probably be paid 400 grand to come up with the same list. It's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. I've got to tell you, Cameron, there's something on this. Again, I'm not going to drop a minute because it would be inappropriate, but this driver is not a Grand Prix winner, never has been, 
he's not bad. He's not brilliant. He's not bad. And he, I was doing some other stuff, some other interviews, and he came to be interviewed today. And he had three team people with him and two policemen. Oh, my god! That's how important Formula One drivers are. I mean, I used to ride around the paddock with Nigel Mansell on a monkey bike when we were going to <laughs> sponsors' events. And, you know, it worked perfectly well. Thank you very much. What's this three team people? What are they doing? They're all standing there looking incredibly intense and, you know, listening to every word he was saying. And it's just so over the top. Mm. I mean, they really are a bit too precious. Not the driver's fault. It's the teams. They're all too precious. And some of the drivers, it is their fault because they should just say, I don't want this rubbish. Go away, you know. Yeah. People Crazy. running around them, carrying their helmets, carrying their drink bottles. I mean, what's it all about? It's a bit much, isn't it? Pathetic. Yeah, uh, it's a bit mu- lacking in humility, if anything. Let me ask you this, well, though. Go on, no, it's, it's 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 lacking in humility, maybe. It's, what it is is too much self-importance. That's what it is. It's a difference, I think. Or taking themselves too seriously, maybe put it like that. I don't mind one bodyguard, one security guard, but, you know, maybe one team person. I'm not quite sure why they need to be there, but maybe. And uh, that's it. Well, three? Yeah. You know? So, so it's not even a star driver we're talking about. <laughs> I tell you what, though, Peter, again, I feel like I've done a bit of a 180 on this as well. What I definitely yeah. don't want to happen. I, I think it's almost irresponsible to ask the drivers to moot themselves whilst they're in the heat of battle, driving at a gazillion miles oh, an hour through yeah. Eau Rouge. How are they going to then... That that's it's, it's not dangerous, but it is, it, it's, it, it's nonsense, well, right? Surely you want to another. It, you want to put yeah, us you're in touching the another cargo. nerve with That's me, Cameron. You're touching yeah, another of my nerves. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, because amongst all the other things that I've always said we should be doing in Formula One, like micing up the road cars, filming the drivers' briefings live, getting the engineers mic'd up in the garage, really getting behind the scenes of the whole Formula One fabric. I've often said that we completely underusing this brilliant thing called team radio. And we we leave it to the teams to do this gibberish over the radio about strap this and strap that. And occasionally there are drivers that say some quite good things, like Sergio Perez complimenting Franco Colapinto on his driving today. And that's good stuff. And that, that's the point I'm making. I've, I yeah. said years ago that the future of team radio, not in qualifying, not in Friday, is to have on race day only, in the race, the drivers should be able to talk to one another. Oh, and wowza. nobody... And I've been saying that for years. Nobody has ever tried to take that further. But can you imagine what that would be like? It would be so cool. And team radio is such a good thing. And we're underusing it. We're making out that it's all much too complex. And the teams always say it's complex. And yet we come to a Sunday night and it's something as basic as tire temperatures or, oh, we didn't understand the setup or we got the strategy wrong. But prior to that, on a Saturday, it's so complex. There's so much data. It's churning out everywhere, the factory, the circuit, everywhere. Nobody can talk because it's so complex. But it's not that complex. It's motor racing. Let's have some Let's have some chat between the drivers. Wow. That would be a different yeah. level, Peter. I can't even imagine what would that what That would be gangbusters. Well, proper everybody's proper. going, they go on about sprint races and reverse grids. If you really want to spice up Formula One, have the chat between the drivers during the race. They'd probably say it's dangerous because somebody would talk when they're in the middle of a corner. But if everybody knows it's that, that you know, do it. I don't, I don't hate that. Get on with it. That's novel. Hmm? Introduce it. Bring it in now. Well, I introduced that years ago and I, and I haven't mentioned it recently, but it's definitely one of the things I would do if you really want to spice up Formula One in a relatively cheap way and just it would be dynamite. Absolute dynamite. That's... And it's much cheaper than, you know, building a new Formula One car that's easy to overtake or, um, yeah, all the other stuff they're doing. Wowza. Go on then, Mr. Wins. As we round third base, talk to me about mini DRS because it seemed like McLaren had something that was a bit tricky on their DRS. It felt it, it looked as if it was pseudo activating when it when the driver didn't have DRS. FIA initially came out and said that it passed the load test. Nothing to see here. We're not changing the rules mid season. And then twenty four hours later, did what the FIA tend to do and completely 180 and said, you know what, they're not going to be able to use that wing again in Las Vegas. What do you reckon of this mini DRS fiasco, just F1 teams f one do you reckon? Um, well, pretty normal. Doesn't worry me that much. I don't think that's made that much of a difference. I think McLaren are probably 
got it on the car to deflect from other things they've been doing because they're quite clever, like most Formula One teams. So I'm not that fussed about it or that interested in it, to be honest. I think all the problems that Red Bull have got are not related to that. And same with, I don't, sorry, rephrase it. I don't think McLaren are where they are because of that. So, you know, I just think it's a great thing for the media and it's like putting a cover over a car, isn't it? As soon as you put a cover on a car, everybody wants to know what's inside it. As soon as you start talking about flexi wings and DRS and all that stuff, everybody, oh, yeah. yeah." (laughs) But believe me, it's a lot more than that. I mean, again, I won't drop the team in it. It's a shame because, you know, all these things you hear in confidence, but there is a team out there that's struggling with traction at the moment, really poor traction. Well, a couple of them are probably more than that, but I know one team is. And I was talking to one of the engineers from that team today, and I said, why, you know, it's a chronic thing. You've had this traction issue for months now. Why did she say, well, like, just soften the rear or do what, you know, you normally would. And he said, oh, we can't make any adjustments because if we did, we'd have to build a completely new gearbox. In other words, they've designed the rear suspension around their gearbox, which, and it's got very little adjustability in it. Oh, wow. And I mean, this takes me back to 1963 when ATS built that ridiculous Formula One car in which you had to take the engine out in order to change gear ratios from memory. And and that's as bad as that. Can you believe that? I mean, again, we live in this super technical world of instant, you know, technology and incredible thing. And as Mercedes have Lewis starting on softs, and then we have one of the Formula One teams that can't solve their traction issue because they have to design a new gearbox Blimey. what's that all about <laughs> you know oh. it's just crazy this is this is f1 Peter. welcome to oh. the world of budget cap i suppose <laughs> is all you can say that's a very good point also isn't mm. it? go on then mr windsor talk to us very finally talk to me about checo perez because and danny rick let's group them up into the same box because it feels like Danny Rick especially this will be his last Grand Prix and I felt really sad I really like Danny Rick as a person that's not to say that he's been performing to where he expected even said it post race that he didn't come back to participate he came back with the sole objective to supersede Checo Perez and and get back his his seat that he had in the senior Red Bull racing team Um, Mm -hmm. are, are they making the right decision in getting rid of Danny Rick for Liam Lawson, who, if the word if word on the F one curb is anything to be invested, then Liam Lawson will be in that red RB Visa cash app seat for Cota. Is that are they right or wrong to make that play, Peter? Uh, I think they're right. I don't think they should have re-signed Daniel anyway, and I think Liam, Liam should have been in that car from the start of the year. So it's a bit of an odd decision to do it now i mean most of us would have done it at the start of the year as i say so it just shows that they're not very good in that area i think um yeah daniel basically signed out of formula one when he left the best team in racing but as it was then with red bull when you do that short of winning a world championship when you won grand prix you're basically saying all the hard work i've put into getting to a team like red bull i'm just going to throw it out the window now because i don't like the, the fact that my teammates quicker than me in a couple of areas a couple of areas not all areas and i've got a big offer with lots of money i'm going to go and take that and be a professional racing driver with lots of money and the minute you do that your heart and soul is knocked out of you basically and it's very difficult to get it back uh, and i daniel's worked pretty hard to get it back and i think when he came back this year with uh visa cash app he did so with the real intention of being the real daniel ricardo again and being that driver that we know and love but it's tough. It's very tough. He's been around a long time, and Yuki Sonoda's not slow. And it's tough. What can I say? You know, yeah. I don't think he should have done it. I think he should have started a new career in WEC or whatever and gone on to win that world championship rather than try to do that. And it's not very becoming of him to be in that team. Now, he says his, his sole objective was to get back into the Red Bull A team. Well, A, he shouldn't have left it in the first place. And B, on what basis was he going to do a better job than Sergio Perez? Bearing in mind, Perez also brings about 40 million to the team through money that is generated around him in Mexico. So even if you could argue that Daniel's a better racer, better overtaker, maybe quicker over a lap 
on some circuits. It's still he's still way behind Perez in terms of what he can bring to the team financially. So it was never going to be never going to happen in my view. That I mean, there's just wishful thinking, um, and you can't turn the clock back, as my mum keeps saying to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you and you know you can't you, you leave red bull you've left red bull you ain't gonna go back you ain't gonna have another chance i don't think so yeah there you go it's just saying and daniel's a lovely guy and um it's great to see him smiling still having a laugh and he, i'm sure he's got a great life ahead of him in many other ways uh and if liam's there let's see how he goes there's lots of new young kids coming along now and uh liam's as i say for me he's um, and I'm getting more and more to be a fan of Franco Colapinto and the way he drives a very soft touch, almost in Lando sort of area, but he's quite long corners, longer than Lando. Um, and that'll probably stay, I would imagine, for most of him. It seems to be something that he does very well. And, uh, you know, I see Liam as not soft a touch as Franco Colapinto. He's m- more aggressive. He's more spiky, in my opinion, than what I've seen of Liam. Great car control. Fearless, great car control. But he's a, he's another driver that you don't want to have too much. Um, well, we were talking earlier about you know uh, expletives and and drivers and educating and controlling them. He's another driver. The more you start to control Liam Lawson and try to make him a clone Formula One driver, the less he'll be Liam Lawson. And right now he's a pretty raw. Well, he's not as raw as he was, but I'm sure he's still quick enough to do the job i just hope they let him be himself and they don't try to change things around him and, and oh it's done this way it's done that way let him be himself because he's a super quick driver yeah and a lot of time for him it's weird christian horner's comments on the driver's market that he already expressed before liam's even turned the wheel in a red bull car he already expressed doubt whether liam lawson could be the next one and, uh, and he cited George Russell that he's out of contract in 2025. And it's the first time that I'm hearing Christian Horner speak like this. I almost feel like it's unfair to talk about Liam with that sort of like to, to plant those seeds of doubt almost preemptively in a young driver's mind before he's even got gotten in the car proper. So I'm a bit concerned as to how this uh, not necessarily that Liam can't do a job, yeah, but, but, but I, yeah, um, yeah maybe. I, I, I'm knowing I don't know Liam that well, but I know well enough. I think, or know, I think I understand him well enough. Let's put it that way to know that all he wants is that Visa Cash App drive on a permanent basis, and and if he's got that, let him focus on that and get the results, and then we'll see what happens in the future. He won't be thinking already. Oh, I've got to be in the A team. Yeah. Christian Horner said something to me. I don't believe he'd be thinking that way. All he'd be thinking about is, I'm going to have to go away and blow Yuki Sonoda away from yeah, race right. one. How am I going to do that? That's what he should be thinking about. And and he, he can do that. You know, he's definitely, I would say he's quicker than Yuki. Will Checo be driving for Red Bull Racing at Kota, or do you think they'll get rid? Because I think there's conversations that they'll be having. They'll be assessing performance. No, I don't think, as I said before, I can't imagine they'd get rid of him for the Mexican Grand Prix if they were going to get rid of him. They'd definitely let him do Mexico. Yeah. Um, and as I said, it's the same argument. You know, he has a good race. Everybody says, oh, wow, Checo, you know, he's back. He loves Baku or whatever they want to say, whatever cliche they want to come up with. And then he has a relatively bad qualifying session, well, very bad qualifying session. And it's, oh, Checo's got to go. And he drove reasonably well in the race. He's in terrible traffic. And he, he's not he's never been a great driver in attack mode. He's very good in defense. And so it was no surprise that he couldn't get past any of those cars. But then you don't hire Checo Perez for being an attack driver. You hire him because he's a very good number two to Max Verstappen, who brings a lot of money to the team. And in a very good car, if things go well, he's going to do a good job. Yeah. And that end the story, you know. As I keep saying, tell me other drivers around who can bring to Red Bull what Checo Perez brings to Red Bull. And I'm talking also about the money as well. So, you know, there aren't many out there. Get, get Nikita Miz- Mazepin. Oh, yeah, that might be the only one, but you well, know, you know, too much performance. You know, you've got to see it in that context. He yeah. brings a lot of money. Lance Stroll, maybe, if he suddenly annoyed, got annoyed with his dad and wanted to drive for a different team, <laughs> he could probably bring a lot of money. You know, that's about it. So, you know, Checo, I mean... He didn't drive very well in qualifying, but obviously the car was not good. And that just accentuates how good a job Max Verstappen did. Yeah. Actually, you know, they've got serious problems with, well, like everybody, and everybody's got inconsistency with the tyres, except McLaren. So because McLaren don't, 
then it's got to be a chassis thing. It's nothing to do with the Pirelli tyres at all. And Red Bull have got it less at the moment than Mercedes and Ferrari, but big issues there. Very well said. Go on and finally, mm. Mr. Windsor, let's talk about Lewis yeah. because the community has reacted with furious rage about Mercedes starting him on, I think, scrubbed soft compound tyres. Why did they do that, Peter? And is that a mistake in in real time, let alone in hindsight? Uh, yeah. I've, 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 they were probably pretty shocked when the covers came off and they, and they were the only one on softs, uh, you know, the quick runners. Mm. So I'm sure they felt very exposed at that moment. What have we missed here? Um, first point. I think... Mercedes incredibly in a sort of childlike way got led into thinking after qualifying that they were pretty quick and had a real chance of winning. Whereas that was a very uh, rarefied Q3 because it basically came, it was basically just a four minute one lap dash with everybody aware that the track was flattening but not the, the, the evolution of the track was had gone up a lot in q2 but then started to flatten off there'd been rain overnight and it was a question of combining margin with pace and getting the tires right and in that situation yeah we saw how good the mclarens were but max did a better job of averaging out the lap than george and lewis george and lewis did a better job of averaging out the lap than ferrari and that's why they were where they were and the, it, the qualifying should have been seen in that context it's it, it wasn't anything more than that because even lando had a slow sector mm -hmm. one on his quick mm -hmm. lap so everybody was kind of out of it but i think lewis i mean if, if lewis thought i'm sure he felt that he'd driven a great lap and this this p3 was you know the return of everything and wow, you know, we can be a bit aggressive here and go for the soft tyre because everybody might have tyre temperature issues getting off the line. And uh, look at Charles, you know, you understeered off at turn two. If I'm on soft tyres, I'm going to have more grip and maybe I can get one, if not two cars, going into turn one with the soft tyre. Really, go for it. And But the problem with that is there was no downside. There was, sorry, there was every downside. And that was that if he didn't actually pass a car or two cars into turn one, the whole reason for being on soft had gone. Yeah. So, and also, you know, any, most of us thought that the qualifying results were a little bit, as I said, rarefied. They weren't just typical. They were, they were anything but typical. And, and so it proved in the race. Yeah. So for me, it was a sort of naive thinking that we've suddenly got there, this sort of whole desperation of Mercedes having to be back at the front again and not being real, realistic about where, how they qualified on the second row like that. You know, they're using the phrase Mercedes lockout. Wow, you know, we're back and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, it was much too early to be saying that. And I felt very sorry for Lewis because he had a terrible race. Mm. You know, he was within about three laps, he was holding up George, which is nothing worse than holding up your teammate. And then... And then he was in a lonely race thereafter, wasn't he? Nobody in front of him, nobody yeah. behind him, really. Blown away by Oscar Piastri on the outside. Just terrible race. All because they chose the soft tyres. And you can't blame Lewis either. I mean, I'm sure he will say, oh, we all win and lose together and we all take the decision together. <laughs> and that's right. You know, there's no way. If they'd said, Lewis, you've got to run the soft tyre, and he didn't want to run the soft tyre, he wouldn't have run, that's for sure. Okay. But, um, you know, you've got to say a lot of the, the blame should go on the team for not stopping him running the soft tire if it was Lewis's fault and certainly suggesting it if it wasn't Lewis's choice. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I do, you know, I do think Mercedes got it wrong there big time. You know, Peter, really big time. Uh, it's, it's, it's rare, very sad. It's rare, Peter, that I defend Mercedes. But I think mm -hmm. on this occasion, if there is an early safety car, like I'm guessing they would have anticipated doing their their um, calculations pre-race. If there's an early safety car, all of a sudden they look like a genius because they've got they've gotten set soft compound out of the way and they go long. I think fresh in the memory is the instance at Jeddah where they went hard for hard or mediums first, and then there was an early safety car as there always is at Jeddah. And Lewis was doing one of these, wasn't he? he? Was like, hang on, guys, I told you that we should have gone the sauce first, so then I could capitalize on this discounted pit stop 
from the safety car circumstance and then gone long mm. or the mediums or the hard. So I think they've, and, and plus that's, the, let, let, let's be not forget that Singapore, every time you've been there, there has always been a safety car apart from today. It's like, I, I feel mm. like they were, I, I feel like the racing gods turned their back on Mercedes yeah. and Lewis ever so slightly. I think yeah, it was a bad that, decision. Yeah. You, you and I will disagree over that because <laughs> I never, ever factor in things like, there might be a safety car. I never ever let that come into my thinking, and but because to me that's information overload by statisticians who are giving us useless information that doesn't have any basis on reality. Mm. All it is is stats from the past. It's not yeah. reality yeah. now. And True. you talk about Jeddah, but the reality is we're completely different Mercedes car now, really, from where we were back then. Different circuit, different ambient, different everything. And you can't guarantee there's going to be a safety car. We've had several races this year where there hasn't been a safety car. And, and so, again, it's flawed. Not, I'm not saying this to you now, but it, it, it's flawed thinking to base it on any of that. Mm. Now, having said all of that, if you're going against the norm and you're going to start on softs, of course, one of the things you might say to yourself and to your driver, well, you know, and there could be a safety car too. And so even if, even if, we're, you know, if we don't get the place, the safety car might help us. But then again, you know, it's a long second stint, isn't it, <laughs> around, yeah. around Singapore. I think Carlos Sainz had the longest stint today, but, you know, even he stopped after about 12, 13 laps or something. I mean, what you're saying is safety car on lap three, first corner accident or whatever, and then put Lewis onto, he's got up to P2 magically. Now you put him on his new set of hards and he's got to do the whole race on a set of hards. Yeah, you know, that's honest. also a difficult thing. And I can just hear Lewis now in my ear, you know, 20 laps to go. My tires are gone. I've got no grip. <laughs> And George passing him three laps from the end of the race, you know, it would have been just as just as bad. So no, I think uh, I'm all for aggressive choices, but I just couldn't, I could not understand what they had in mind with that soft choice for Lewis, because yeah. there's no way that was a first stint tire, in my opinion, and I think that was proved to be the case. You know, how many laps was it before you started to hold up George? Two laps, three laps. Uh, he, you know, and it didn't help him off the line either, really. It did a little bit. He got the run on Max. He was alongside Max, but still wasn't enough. Yeah, no. And it's a pretty short run there. And I saw, uh, I think there was a quote from Toto Wolf saying, you know, we thought that over the opening lap, and maybe it wasn't, it was maybe the media guy saying it, over the opening lap, Lewis would be able to pick up positions on the soft tire. Well, where exactly? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not as if the soft tire is going to give them massive overtaking opportunity if he hasn't done it into the first corner on the soft tires he ain't going to do it at the first lap in my opinion again so it had to be off the line and he was on the right side of the grid so it was worth going on in that respect he maybe he was going to get max you know and but when he didn't the gig was up you know i suppose the, the only thing you can say is at least they split their options and they had george on the on the proper strategy and at least he had a reasonable race and finished p4 but you know, Lewis was. I can't imagine how you how he, enjoy, he endured that race. I was going to say because he loves Singapore, he loves the whole atmosphere and the concerts and the musicians and the whole thing. And and he qualified third, and then he's just droning around oh. in the middle of nowhere. Really terrible pain, pain for Lewis Hamilton fans all over the world. Many of whom... well, it was you know yeah. such a shame, such a waste, really, because you know. He's he, he's driving very well now, and we saw that in qualifying. He got in that really good average lap, very like Max's, and uh, uh, just thrown away. Oh dear! The weird and wacky world of F1 mm. that we inhabit, Mister Windsor. It's it's mm. it's always chaos. But listen, you've been super generous of your time, Mister Windsor. If you yeah, enjoy no worries, this, Cam, always... you're a legend, Peter. Mm. Honestly, I can't thank you enough. Great no worries. in extremis. If you enjoy Mr. Windsor's God tier level insight, then go and subscribe to his <laughs> YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed already, what are you doing? Go now. And then shortly thereafter, jump across to your favorite podcasting platform and follow and drop five stars on the Short Corners podcast. Mr. Peter D. Windsor in audio form two. How do you like your F1? Ladies and gents, <laughs> if you're watching this on the YouTubes, do me a favor, like, share and drop a comment. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, do me a favor, five stars and follow mr windsor you're a legend thank you for the time as always Thanks, you guys watching thank you do me a favor between now and next time 
Remember to look, but never stare.